Good morning or afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our FISMA Fridays. It is um, hard to believe that we're already in November. This um, year has certainly flown by and a uh, lot has happened on the FISMA front. And as always, I expect a very interactive and informative session uh, with our monthly sessions here. We're, we're excited to uh, get started. So again, welcome to FISMA Fridays. My name is Jill Bender, uh, VP of Marketing with Safety Chain. Uh, today's topic will be around environmental controls. Um, before we get started, as always, a few housekeeping tips. Uh, recording, as always, will be sent out um, on Monday. If you have questions, we'll do our best to try to answer as they come in and or after we go through some of the pre-submitted questions or we'll take some offline if we don't get to all of them. As always, for privacy, um, you should only be able to see the panelists. Um, so as I suspected and what has become the quorum here with FISMA Fridays, quite a few people are calling and dialing in and thank you. Uh, we've seen lots of regular folks online with us today and uh, quite a few na new names I haven't recognized in the past. So delighted to have everyone with us. For today's session, I'm absolutely delighted to have Payman back with uh, the Atchison Group. Welcome Payman, glad you're able to bring, come back to FISMA Fridays. Thank you, Joe. It's good to be back, and thank you, everyone, for joining in. Uh, and then I am just absolutely delighted also to um, welcome Gurjeet with the Atchison Group. She has been well indoctrinated with TAG and has been with them for a good bit of time now, but this will be her FISMA for first FISMA Friday, so we'll try to go easy on her, but we look forward to uh, having you as part of our dialogue today, too. Welcome. Thank you. So with that, we're going to go ahead and just dive in. We always kick off as always, and uh, Payment, I'll go ahead and ask you to share with us um, this past month, what is the latest on the FISMA front? Sure, Jill. Thank you, and uh, thank you again for everyone for joining, joining in. Um, November was a, has been, or at least since our last discussion, has been a busy month for for the FDA. They've had as an ongoing process of issuing a number of guidances that are going to be coming out in the next uh, year or so. And uh, they've, they've came out with three of them since we last discussed. And one was the Small Entity Compliance Guide. Uh, that was really intended as a guidance that outlines who must comply with the rule in terms of small entities who was exempt from parts of the rules or subject to potential modified requirements and generally outline some of the key information for qualified facilities, small businesses. Um, those essentially, and it hasn't really changed from the original final rule, those with fewer than 500 full-time employees must comply with the human animal food rules by uh, September 2017, September 18, 2013, so one year from now, a little less than a year from now. So that remains the same, but for very small businesses, generally averaging less than $1 million per year for human foods or $2.5 million for animal food sales, are required to maintain records that support their status as a qualified facility as of the beginning of this year, 2016. And they need to come into compliance with the human animal food rules, foods rule by September 17, 2018. And it's a fairly lengthy uh, guidance document, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't read all of it yet. But glance, glancing at it, it has some very specific, specific references to subparts C, G, and B being the establishment and implementation of food safety system, and uh, you know, hazard analysis, risk-based preventive controls by conducting the hazard analysis and identifying risks that need preventive controls, hazards that need preventive controls. If, uh, some of that uh, hazards are being controlled by your supply chain, then a risk-based supply chain program is going to be required as well. So not a whole lot different uh, than what's essentially outlined for larger facilities. Uh, if you do have to have a preventive control, then a recall plan is required, and monitoring, verification, records, and reanalysis as outlined in the subpart C. As I mentioned, the subpart G does require risk-based supply chain program. For those material that the hazard analysis has been controlled before receipt, so by your suppliers. So the, the supply chain program needs to be implemented there. And um, for current good manufacturing practices, they must, they must meet the Part 17 subpart B requirements. And that goes through a series of, you know, all, all that 
entailed within the uh, subpart B. And I encourage those companies that fall within the you know, small entities uh, compliance guide uh, requirements to go through that and ensure that they meet the requirements. In terms of exemptions, it does talk about, and I think that's consistent with what generally we've been talking about, which is qualified facilities, essentially those with less than $500,000 in sale, and at least half of those sales to local consumers and retailers within the same state or a 275 mile radius. Uh, those are exempt. Uh, obviously, those with seafood has up, juice has up, those that make alcoholic beverages are exempt from uh, the preventive controls rules, but certainly the, the CGMP rules apply. And they also talk about some on-farm low-risk activities uh, that are very specific ones, such as raisins or, or certain processes that distilling, among others, that I would also encourage folks to take a look at and see how that applies to, to their facilities as well. Further, the Small Entity Compliance Guide does talk about what foods are covered uh, that are subject to either the CGMP, the current food manufacturing practices, and or the hazard analysis, risk rate preventive controls. So are they subject to both the CGMPs and the hazard analysis, risk based preventive controls, or one or the other. And so that's essentially a quick overview of the Small Entity Compliance Guide. They also came out with, with a, a guidance on those folks that uh, intend, if, would, would like to take advantage of the Voluntary Qualified Importer Program, essentially intended for those who import foods for human and animals, and essentially helps them expedite uh, the food through issuance of a facility certification that accompanies the food. And there's a whole list of eligibility requirements, fees, instructions for users and benefits, and even grounds for revocation in an event that FDA finds that uh, either the food or the facility importing the food uh, has violated some of the requirements. Uh, just an overview of some of the eligibility requirements uh, includes establishment of a history, so at least having a three years of importation history, obviously have a BNS DUNS number for those who import products, and there should not be any import alert or recall on the foods that are being imported, either whether they're under the VQIP, Voluntary Qualified Importer Program, or, uh, or not by, by the manufacturer. And in terms of timelines, the program begins on October 1 and runs through September of the next year. So it's, it's, on, it's on that kind of fiscal year. And so for those who are interested, they'll need to submit the form uh, from January to end of May of the year that they would like to join the VQIP program. And the guide has a number of useful questions and answers on there that I think uh, those who are interested will find it useful. Um, and and we've talked about that in the past. There are some benefits to it. I think some of it has still waiting to be fully realized or perhaps, you know, determining how does it really benefit the company, you know, the companies that want to import food. But in generally, uh, there is an expedited entry, a limited testing to only for cause in case an FDA finds uh, an issue that they need to further investigate and in, in event of a recall, com consumer complaints issues with similar products from other importers, and, um, and they work with the importer at the port of entry, so you're not forced to send it elsewhere. They will, you know, once you qualify for the VQIP program, they seem to have, uh, they work with you better because you've kind of met the high standards that the FDA set for, for import entry. So in principle, I think it's a great program and a signal to your customers, perhaps, that you have hit the high bar with respect to FDA compliance. But the real value, I think, remains to be seen uh, from the perspective that, you know, not every, obviously every shipment is, is being uh, inspected, and so with the percentage that is, obviously they're going to prioritize which ones are going to be uh, further looked at and whether or not VQIP helps there, I think remains to be seen, but it's a program that the companies can, can take advantage of to circumvent any 
delay that may be caused due to inspection, testing. And I think one thing I might add is that the testing does get expedited if it, if it does happen. And uh, so, you know, they, if they will make an effort to work with you to, to expedite the entry once you're um, entered into the program, there is a quality assurance program that uh, is fairly well in detail given into, the, into this guide, and I would encourage those who are interested to take a look at it and see what uh, uh, components of the program that they have, they most likely do, and that just can add and, and meet the requirements. Lastly, there was a guidance on describing a hazard that needs to be controlled and documented by the company the food. So essentially, if a entity has identified hazards with food that require preventive control or need to be managed otherwise, but that those hazards are not being controlled by the entity, so they're going to be controlled downstream by, by their customers before they reach the consumers. So this disclosure must be made by the document that are accompanying the food and essentially affects four of the main rules of the FISMA, that is preventive controls for human animal foods, produce safety, and foreign supplier verification. And essentially for human and animal foods, and I know it's a lot that I'm talking about here, but the guides do go in some depth here and are, are quite useful. And I encourage you to take a look at it and we'd be happy to have further discussion on this And because I, I need to digest this further. But QPEC is mostly about biological hazards because I think they take into account that most chemical and physical hazards are generally controlled by the first manufacturer, by the company that has essentially manufactured the product, either your supplier or the supplier's supplier. Uh, for biological hazards, the identified hazards can be described in general terms, microbial pathogens rather than listeria or salmonella. Or they can be called those with public health significance. So they keep it general, but they, but by putting that, you're essentially recognizing that there is a risk here that needs to be managed. And the information can be part of the labeling, could be part of the essentially bill of lading, the shipment specific COA for that shipment, and other documents that a food safety manager for the customer, the receiving facility, would read. And that's true essentially for both preventive controls for human foods as well as animal foods. If in, in any case there is a, they have a control for chemical or physical hazards, then those need to be, uh, the document needs to include that as well. But the assumption is that in most cases, such as, you know, corns with aflatoxin or the produce with uh, potential field debris are generally handled at the, at the first manufacturer. So they don't expect that to be a, a major component, but biological hazards, certainly. Uh, produce safety, the same thing, applies essentially to all produce and farm activities that are covered under produce safety, but will receive commercial processing to reduce the presence of organisms of public health significance, spore formers, using a validated process, such as tomato paste, uh, it's an example they give, or creating shelf-stable tomatoes. So in that case, the farm supplying the produce must supply documentation that the food is not processed to adequately reduce the likelihood of organisms. So they haven't managed uh, either the farm or the activities within the farm to reduce the likelihood of this organism and are relying on their downstream customers to manage that before the product reaches the, the consumers. And lastly, the foreign supplier verification program again requires importers who implement a foreign supplier verification program to ensure they meet the same standards of the food produced domestically. So essentially the same as domestic food, but when imported foods cannot be consumed without controlling the hazard, um, such as coffee beans uh, or otherwise, that importer must disclose to the consumer customers that the food is not processed to control that hazard. So that's um, try to not to go too far, too long, but those are a number of guidances that have come out, there's three of them, and they're going to be coming out with more. And we'd be happy to have uh, discussions uh, after this, 
if there's anybody online that's interested, but I would encourage you to take a look at those. I think they do a good job of going down and identifying specific nuances to each rule that, that apply to either the small entities or those going through the VQIP or uh, need to accompany documents uh, with foods that are going to be uh, the, managed by downstream customers. So, Jill, that was a long-winded one, but um, those are the updates on the FISMA site. Yeah, no, um, cer certainly important updates, so thank you for that. And I know in the past, as these guidance documents have been rolled out, um, that the Atchison Group has been supplying links to them so that our audience can quickly grab those. Do you know if that, that I'm assuming that will be the case as well with some of the ones you just yes, went through? Yes, of course. In fact, I think our newsletter, the last one we sent out uh, was about the VQIP program guidance that okay. just came out, but the link to the actual guidance will be on our website as well, as you said. Okay, great. Um, well, let's go ahead and get um, going then on our topic for today, and thank you for that. Um, just in regards to environmental controls and control programs, it's a topic that has been requested um, in the last few months, and really I look forward to at least at a high level reviewing a few things and then talking about a few things today around environmental controls. So I'm going to go ahead and um, Asa, Gurjit, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us just the overall, you know, the importance of an environmental control program. Thank you, Jill. Um, so, so when I when I look at the slide, the, uh, the the question kind of seems pretty straightforward at first glance. It appears to be very very obvious why um, you know the environmental controls program is uh, <clears throat> super important. But it's also useful to keep at the back of your mind that um, the FDA right now are under quite a lot of pressure, especially for the last six months, uh, to ensure that firms are initiating food recalls in a timely manner. Um, with timely, when I say timely manner, I mean, you know, promptly. Um, there was a report about six months ago where they were, you know, criticized, if you like. Um, and so a new team has been called in um, called SCORE, Strategic Coordinated Oversight of Recall Execution, and they're basically um, ensuring or they're helping the agency to make swift decisions. So no matter what the obstacles are, you know, they're going to get to a decision very quickly. And um, so, you know, so that's really one aspect from my perspective that really highlights the importance of environmental controls because when the FDA or if the FDA are investigating and there's a recall or an investigation, they come into your facility, they're going to be asking about your environmental controls and they're going to be assessing them and so, you know, and ensuring that they're well implemented. And, uh, and, and that's basically, you know, that gives you a really good indication of where the facility is with the remaining um, elements of the food safety program. So, um, and hysteria and salmonella infections, if you look at the CDC website, you know, if the, the report for 2015, it's, it's not going down. So for Listeria and Salmonella, I think it's per 100,000 people, um, you know, you still have that stagnant sort of level where no matter what we're doing in our facilities, no matter how we improve our environmental controls, those infections aren't moving. Um, so obviously, you know, although I think 0157 has gone down and compiler batch has increased a little bit, um, despite the work we're doing, you know, we just need to really focus on that. So these become the building blocks of the environmental monitoring program. Does that make sense? No, absolutely, and, and thank you. And I think it's it's um, interesting when you talk about um, what's become more prevalent, what's, what's um, diminished a little bit. But when you tie that in with FISMA, which brings us to our next question, I mean, you, you've touched on this, but Payment, I'll ask you to sort of step in here on this one as well. You know, what is FISMA saying then specifically about the environmental controls and, and with FDA approaching it? Uh, thank you, Jill. Yeah, this is a very pertinent question and it ties in nicely with what Virgil just mentioned. And that is, uh, well, obviously FISMA with the current good manufacturing does lay out uh, some uh, high level guidance in terms of how to manage the facilities, uh, they're not prescriptive, so they leave, they leave it up to the facility how to specifically manage it, but that uh, in terms of facility design, and we're going to talk more, a little bit more about that, uh, the employee GMPs, hygienic zoning, the, the utensil, the sanitation, the pest programs, uh, all of that. Um, but there's some specific language, and we've talked about that in the past, but it's, it's just never, it's always good to bring it back up and just remind that 
their language within FSMA says that if a ready-to-eat food is exposed to the facility environment after uh, the final treatment step or you know, once it's formulated and before it gets packaging and then does not see any further packaging, further treatment in that packaging, then there is a requirement for the facility to implement an environmental monitoring program to ensure that the, or verify that the controls that you do have in place are, are effective and it's a verification step. So there's a requirement for an environmental monitoring program and we'll talk a little bit further about that afterwards later on. Um, one thing in terms of FDA approach to it, as Gurdjie had mentioned, they are under the pressure, they are under a mandate to find out how the facilities are managing this uh, program, not just doing the testing and showing a bunch of negatives, but, and if they are finding positives, how are they taking correct actions, how are they following up, what changes they're making and how well they're documenting. And, and we're seeing more than ever FDA taking the approach of linking some previous findings from the years before or perhaps even product and clinical isolates to potentially environmental isolates now. So the question of resident organism becomes a, uh, has, has been a uh, kind of in forefront, forefront of some of the discussions that FDA has, has had. Um, with the facilities, and, you know, they are using next-gen sequencing or genome sequencing and other molecular methods to make that link and, and driving facilities to either recall the product and in some cases perhaps even uh, some, some criminal activity. So our take is not to scare uh, the, the industry but rather Make sure that if you do have an environmental monitoring program, that you are diligent in following up with when, whenever you have a positive, find out what happened, what caused it, what are some of the root causes to this, um, take corrective action, document everything, and build a story and a justification of doing what you did so you can explain what you've done. But I would also, urge the industry to consider taking it one step further. If you do have some recurring events, um, such as salmonella coming up, within an area or within a reasonable area that could get, uh, you know, that could get travel within a facility to consider, uh, see what is the linkage there and genetically between the isolates. Um, there are laboratories that offer this service and I think it would be beneficial to determine are they coming from the same niche, same source, or are they from different sources? Are they the same organisms, different, different strains of the same salmonella or listeria? So that's the FDA approach, and that's the approach that I think the industry needs to take as well to get a better understanding of, of, of the environment within the facility. And, no, thank you for that. I think the the concept of you know the the systematic issues, right? Things that have been recurring over and over is always um, challenging in in you know in making sure that you've identified that trend and, and taking action, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, interesting. Well, I, I don't know if um, you've scared folks on this call, but certainly it, it <laughs> made me pause, right? As far as what you were discussing. <laughs> Oh, no, I think yeah, I, I, I always, you know, when we have this discussion, um, I, you know, there is a caveat there. I mean, we do, we do, FDA wants to see the facilities do diligently take action, not just show a, you know, three years of negative results, because we know that the facilities are not sterile environments. It's okay to find it, it's what you do about it is, right. is the key here, is how they manage their results and, and show the actions they've taken all the way to redesigning the facility, the, 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 the traffic patterns, the sanitary designs and the conditions of the facility to show that you've taken steps and diligently going about solving the problem. Not doing about anything about it is what is getting facilities into trouble. 
that, that, that seems to, to make sense. Well, when you think about that, too, and just in general, the environmental controls and brings, you know, to our next um, sort of topic, you know, could you just sort of at a very high level um, sort of go through the key principles of environmental control? Sure. So I think it's, it, it all kind of ties in together. So we, we did talk about uh, how to prevent ingress of the organism into the facility. Is it through separation of raw materials from a ready-to-eat environment, control of their supply chain so that ingredients are uh, within spec that are not contaminated and are coming in. If you know that there is some inherent level of contamination with some ingredients, they're managed properly at the facility so that they don't further contaminate. Uh, so the hygienic zoning here becomes extremely important. And again, control, controlling the environment, so hygienic zoning, following the GMPs, uh, your you know, if you take a look at the CGMP uh, programs that the FDA has, they're, they lay out, you know, there is the employee hygiene, there is sanitary design of the equipment. Uh, we've probably more, than, more often than not uh, run into issues where the equipment is, is quite efficient in processing, but it wasn't designed uh, with some very specific sanitary design uh, questions and parameters in mind. Uh, they were so focused on essentially making sure that it runs smoothly, that taking apart or or cleaning it has uh, was, was overlooked. And unfortunately, we run into that situation. Not a lot, but it does happen. So uh, those are certainly one of the key principles of um, of environmental controls, uh, condition of the floor, whether it's a wet or a dry environment, floors is, uh, can be one of the dirtiest parts of the facility. And if they're harbored sites, there are uh, unevenness in the floor surface, the breakage, there is um, a difficulty to clean, and equipment, the organism gets lodged in and, and you know, if there's any kind of a wet cleaning, then it can become quite a harvest site. So managing the floor conditions, and we talked about sanitary design of the equipment and the facilities, sanitation, whether it's a sanitation program or um, the, the chemicals or the people, uh, and ensuring that it's effectively cleaning the equipment. The equipment. And lastly, environmental monitoring as a verification step that these programs are are effective are, are some of the key principles. And uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about the environmental monitoring program as well. So these are some high-level ones. Obviously, there's quite a bit of depth there that we, we could go to uh, but for the interest of time. So take a look at all of these. Take, take a look at uh, GMP, the hygienic zoning, the floor and facility conditions, the design of the equipment and uh, the sanitation, pest control, and essentially the flow of the product from raw to the finished side and people as well. Those are all control measures that you can put, in, put into a facility and process to, to maintain your environment. So I think I count about maybe six or seven <laughs> that you might have listed there. <laughs> yeah. um, but again, you know, from a, from a holistic approach, it, it certainly makes sense. And again, um, you know, to many of those that are taking notes, you know, we do send a recording out. And I think um, there's some great information as always and might be behoove us to try to put a, a modified transcript out of to, for today's session as well. Um, no, great. Thank you. Let's go ahead and just move on in the interest of time and um, – Georgie, I'm going to ask you to, you know, go back to you on this. In, just in regards to um, environmental controls and how they're different from environmental monitoring. Thanks, Jill. <clears throat> so um, environmental control is all about keeping your environment free from any potential um, pathogens. And, and so you have your food safety programs in place, which uh, Payne touched on as well regarding sanitation practices, regarding GMPs and traffic flows, and, you know, the, um, as well as training. 
And so with environmental monitoring, it's, um, it's more of a verification activity to ensure that the, the food safety programs um, underpinning the, uh, the program are actually effective. So um, it, allows you to, it allows you to get a baseline of where you are from a micro profile for your facility. It allows you to identify any potential sources of contamination. And effectively, it allows you to follow a moving target. That's the best way of explaining it because things change all the time. So whether you're getting new equipment, you're moving equipment, you've got new processes, new ingredients, new people, um, you know, it's, it's a moving target and you just need to stay on top of it. So your environmental monitoring is really, you know, you're swabbing, you're sampling, making sure you've got the, uh, the correct frequency, the correct number of swabs, um, and also, in terms of, uh, you know, having it tested and making sure that you're having it tested via an accredited method. Um, so it goes from sampling to, um, to trending. And the, um, you know, I, I think the biggie here really is um, to be ahead of the game. Look at what your results are showing. Um, Make sure you're breaking down equipment. Make sure your your facility is aware of you know where the trends where the trends are going, and uh, and you know be prepared to answer any questions whether it's via your customer or uh, or, or through the FDA. Um, if the FDA come knocking at your door, to uh, to answer and have answers for what did you do when you did when you did find the positive, what corrective actions do you have. And, uh, and, you know, is it under control? I mean, you've really got to do it from the bottom of your heart. You've got to do it wholeheartedly um, and not just, you know, do the swabs for, for the sake of um, gathering data. <laughs> um, because if you don't find it, somebody else will. Well, well, that's interesting. We often say that there's, there's always, and we hear this time and time again from folks in the industry, that lots of data out there, but if it's not being utilized or analyzed, then it's a bit like dumb data, right? And I think there's a more eloquent way of saying that, um, but, it, it, but it hones in on what you were talking about, I would imagine. Um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's all about getting ahead of the game and, mm. uh, and knowing what to get facility. Right, right. So, um, so hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say. I mean, for me, sanitation programs and sanitary design are the um, you know are the key drivers here, which uh, Payman did actually touch on. Um, you've really got to get inside that equipment and uh, and know what's hiding or lurching, uh, you know, behind the, uh, the the face of it. Um, and if you if you don't dismantle it, you're not really going to know. And I think. I think there are a lot of generic programs out there in terms of, um, you know, sanitation um, SSOPs. But if you if you don't make it very specific and know where the key harbourage points are for each piece of equipment, you know, it, it's your potential pathogens may be moving around and you never quite get them. So, um, so yeah, I I think those two are, are key. And from an equipment manufacturer perspective, I mean, you know, they, the companies have really Take a, um, you know, decided to take the lead on um, the the design of uh, of equipment, and you know, the food industry has been has been pushing them. Um, so, you know, now's the time to really work with the equipment guys to uh, to to be ahead of the game, so that you can be, you know, you can clean your equipment more effectively and uh, more efficiently. No, thank you for that. It, it's interesting when we were talking about having this topic, um, the, the equipment side certainly is always um, a key component, but it, I, I really appreciate, and I know the audience says too, as far as the emphasis and sort of the cornerstone that you're talking about, um, absolutely. Wow, mm -hmm. lots of information there today. And I know um, as with FISMA Fridays, they always seem to come uh, fairly um, quick and come to a close too quickly. I know um, some questions have come in. I don't think we're gonna have time to answer those and we will take them offline. So I, I do um, apologize for that, just in the interest of time. There was one question that did talk about, or at least suggested, you know, with the incoming administration, wanting to understand if things have ch will change. You know, we had a topic last month that was talking about the impending election. Um, so I think that's something we can certainly discuss and bring up um, in our, our closing session for the year in December. 
Um, so with that, thank you so much. It's um, been, um, as always, a very informative session. Um, I would be remiss, as always, if I didn't mention um, TAG services. Obviously, all members of the Atchison Group team, uh, as we know, are well-versed and um, are consultants out there working with the industry. So if you all have needs or a gap, gap analysis that need to be done or guidance, um, the TAG team is there for you. And then, of course, as host of this event, um, Safety Chain Software, our solutions, once solid programs and the ability to actually do something with your data and analyze and make sure your, your um, programs are working and being executed to plan is what um, our food safety and quality management solutions are all about. So I look forward to and, and uh, talking with people as far as what Safety Chain can do for you. So with that, again, thank you both Payman and Gurjeet for the informative session today. Um, we will have a wrap-up session of 2016 in December. The session will be a little bit earlier um, given the holidays and everyone on, on this line will get information to that. There's some events coming up at the end of the month, um, excuse me, going into December, um, Food Safety Consortium, um, NLS Food Quality Symposium, Safety Chain will be at, um, SQF Info Days. And as always, as mentioned, um, TAG, please visit their website for links to guidance documents. And if you're not a, a member of their newsletter um, group, it's a great newsletter. And uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up today's session. So thank you so much, um, both Payman and Gurjeet, for joining us today. Very much appreciated. And we will capture everyone else's questions offline and look forward to next month's session. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. It's good to be with thank you again. Thanks. Thanks.